Welcome to CMED's virtual webinar. My name is Manny Jad and I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for Middle East Development. I would like to share a few technical notes with you before we start. While you can see our panelists and moderator, they cannot see or hear you. If you are joining us using Zoom, please note that the chat box at the bottom of your screen we will share announcements during the webinar with you here. However, we will not be, you will not be able to add comments in the chat box. If you have any questions for our panelists or moderator, please type them in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you add your name, your country, and or affiliation before you ask a question. Please keep your questions concise so that we can answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A. Since the talk will be recorded, Note that your name, country, and or affiliation will be part of the recording. Only the CMED team will be able to see your questions, and in some rare cases, we will answer your question in writing in the Q&A box. If you are joining us on YouTube, you will not be able to ask a question because comments will be disabled. We are recording the entire presentation today, and the recording will be available after the event on the CMED website, YouTube channel, and Facebook page. Lastly, I would like to introduce you to our moderator today, Mr. Steve Zipperstein. Zip, Steve Zipperstein is a lecturer of public policy and global studies at UCLA and a senior fellow at CMED. He also serves as a lecturer of history at UC Santa Barbara and as a visiting professor of law at Tel Aviv University. Zipperstein is the author of a recently published book, Law and the Arab-Israeli Conflict, The Trials of Palestine. He is finishing another book regarding the legal history of the Arab-Jewish conflict in Palestine between 1939 and 1948. In addition, he also published several academic articles. Zipperstein practiced law for more than 37 years in California, Washington, DC, New York, and New Jersey. He is a member of the American Law Institute and a life fellow of the American Bar Foundation. We hope you enjoy today's presentation and I'll now pass it along to Mr. Steve Zipperstein. Thank you so much, Manny, for that very kind introduction. Welcome all of you to our wonderful CMED webinar today. And I say wonderful because we are really blessed to be joined uh, by two very distinguished authors who have uh, written this very, very important book, Syrian Requiem, The Civil War and Its Aftermath. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna hear from our two authors first. Then we're going to hear from two Syria experts who will comment on the book. Then we'll have a panel discussion with our two authors and our two experts, and then we'll be very, very pleased to take your questions. As Manny indicated, please put your questions in the Q&A box and remember to identify yourself, your country, and your affiliation and to keep your, your questions concise so that we can get to as many as possible. Um, I want to thank uh, our co-sponsors, uh, the UCLA Burkle Center for International Relations and the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs Department of Public Policy. Thank you so much for your co-sponsorship. Let me now introduce our two co-authors who will uh, begin our discussion today. We are very, very honored to have with us Ambassador Itamar Rabinovich, Professor Emeritus of Middle Eastern History at Tel Aviv University, former Israeli Ambassador to the United States, former Israeli chief negotiator with Syria in the mid-1990s, and the former president of Tel Aviv University from, from 1999 to 2007. Ambassador Rabinovich is president emeritus and counselor of the Israel Institute in Washington, DC and Tel Aviv, and a distinguished fellow of the Brookings Institution's foreign policy program. He's written 10 books on the modern history and politics of the Middle East, He's the co-author and co-editor of several other volumes and the author of many, many essays and papers. And of course, the co-author of uh, the book that we're gonna hear about today, this new and very, very important book. Um, the co-author of the book is a very distinguished scholar in her own right, Dr. Carmeet Valenci, research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv, director of the Syria Research Program there, editor of Strategic Assessment, specializing in contemporary Middle East, strategic studies, military concepts, and terrorism. Uh, Dr. Valenci received her PhD in political science from Tel Aviv University. Uh, her research focuses on so-called hybrid actors, 
such as Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, and the FARC in Colombia. She was a research fellow with the Fox Fellowship in Regional and International Studies at Yale from 2010 to 2011, and she's been a consultant for the Israel Defense Forces. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Ambassador Rabinovich and Dr. Valenci. Thank you again, both of you, so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve. Thank you all. Uh, I, will, uh, I will begin. And I would like to speak about the concept of the book and some of its uh, aspects. Um, when we set out to write a book about uh, the Syrian civil war and its aftermath, we decided not to write a straight narrative, as many uh, authors do in, in this and in other similar cases, but to put the emphasis on analysis of the forces at work. As we know, tragically, this has been a very complicated uh, event uh, in which domestic, regional, and international uh, actors have interacted with one another, affected one another, and created this very complex and, at this point, insoluble uh, issue. So the core of the book are the three chapters that deal with the respectively domestic, regional, and international actors. There are two preceding chapters that uh, uh, offer a narrative of uh, Syrian uh, history and politics from independence to the eve of the uh, outbreak of the civil war and a final chapter dealing with the more contemporary or the current uh, issues. Uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, to the actors, one word about um, uh, and it, the international actors, it's, uh, it's written in a disproportionate way because the United States receives a much uh, greater space uh, as compared to Russia, while in fact Russia has played a major role, a more important role in the civil war and actually contributed to uh, uh, keeping uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad in power. He, is not, he did not win the civil war, but he survived the civil war and he did so because of uh, Russian and, uh, and Iranian help. But uh, US policy is much more complex and much more available. Uh, there's not that much that we know about uh, domestic debates in the, uh, in the Kremlin about uh, Syria policy, uh, different actors and so forth. We know a lot about the debates inside the Obama administration, about the uh, zigzagging during the uh, <clears throat> Trump administration. There are memoirs, there are revelations, and uh, we were tempted to, to deal with it. So there's almost a separate essay uh, that deals with uh, two important periods in American policy uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East. In the uh, chapter dealing with uh, domestic actors, uh, we decided to uh, include the section dealing with what we call the culture war, the war between the regime and the opposition over the support of the cultural and artistic communities. Syria, until, uh, until the uh, tragic civil war, was a very important cultural and artistic hub uh, in, the, uh, in the Arab world. It's uh, theater, it's literature, it's intellectuals, uh, television shows uh, have played a very important role uh, in the Arab world. And um, there was a contest between the regime and the opposition uh, trying to win over famous uh, artists and cultural figures uh, to, their, uh, to their side. So we deal with that. And we also deal with the positions taken by the major figures of uh, Syrian intellectual and cultural uh, life. Sadiq al-Adam, the greatest uh, Syrian intellectual in the second part of the uh, previous century. And we are fortunate to have his son Amr uh, uh, with us as a, as a panelist. He, he really was a great man, a great critic of, of the regime who ended uh, his life in exile, uh, and Adonis, the, the greatest Syrian poet. And in a way, they tell the story of the conflict because the Azams uh, are a great Damascus family. The Azams were the, uh, the dynasty of the governors of Damascus in the 18th century and have been very important in Damascus and Syrian politics uh, and life in, in general. Adonis comes from an Alawite village, the Alawite minority, uh, is actually in power. The Assads are Alawites. Adonis, of course, is not his original name. It's a nom de plume. Uh, he lives in, in Paris. And while uh, uh, Azam was uh, very critical of the regime, Adonis was only mildly critical, uh, if, if that. So uh, we hope that uh, 
the reader will benefit uh, not just from a narrative that uh, has included in the book, but from the analysis of the different uh, forces uh, domestically, the regional actors and the two principal international actors, the United States and, and Russia. And let me now pass the baton to my uh, partner, Kermit. Good morning, and thank you for organizing this event. It is a great pleasure to be here. Um, when we first began thinking about writing this book, it seems that a war was about to end with the victory of Bashar al-Assad. It started with the conquest of Aleppo province in December 2016, and later with the regime capturing all but the area of Idlib in northwest Syria. Ten years into the war and no solution is in sight for Syria, one of the longest and most violent conflicts of our time basically resulted in an unprecedented humanitarian crisis with a dramatic balance, half a million victims, 13 million people in need, and 12 million refugees and internally displaced persons. The title we chose for this book reflects our belief that Syria of the years of 1963 till 2011, which was a strong state, a very important regional uh, actor, and even to some extent, an international uh, actor, does not exist now, and it is unlikely to be restored anytime soon. Bashar al-Assad may have managed to hold on to power, but he lacks internal legitimacy and is entirely dependent on Iran and Russia, and fails to fully apply governance and control over Syria's uh, territory. And I would like to say a few words about uh, this uh, point. Currently, Syria is divided de facto into a number of enclaves. Assad, with the military support of Russia, Iran, and its proxies, allegedly controls two thirds of the country, mainly the backbone connecting the major cities of Aleppo, uh, Homs, and Damascus, and to a lesser extent, uh, the south. All other areas are divided between Turkish control or influence, Kurdish forces, opposition groups, um, US forces, Shiite militias, and ISIS. And the control of Syria's borders also indicates that the state's uh, limit, limited and fragile uh, sovereignty. So for instance, the Syrian army controls approximately 15% of the country's international land borders. The Syrian-Lebanese border is under the control of Hezbollah. The Iraqi-Syrian border is controlled on both sides by Shiite militias that are obviously Iranian proxies. And finally, the Syrian-Turkish border is controlled by elements that do not include the Assad regime and its uh, patron, um, Iran. So we can be skeptical about Assad's victory and his ability to enforce control and order um, over Syria. Having said that, I believe that Assad's most immediate threats are not the rebel uh, factions and the presence of foreign powers. Instead, it is the crushing economic crisis and the impoverished population that is um, struggling to get enough food. Um, Syria's economy is worse than at any time since the war began, and it is largely stemming from years of war, but also um, the result of a deep economic crisis in Lebanon, the sanctions, of course, and the Syrian regime, corruption and mismanagement. So the situation is that an estimated 90% of the Syrian population today live below the poverty line. And this has resulted in increasing frustrations among the Syrian, which have materialized through criticism expressed mostly on social media and also uh, small protests against the continuous deterioration of the country's economy and government's policies. However, it's important to emphasize that these signs of dissent and criticism do not indicate the, uh, uh, that another wave of um, massive protest is coming, especially after nearly 10 years of uh, brutal conflict. So we can clearly see that the Syrian war has transformed from an intense military conflict into a deep socioeconomic crisis. Um, experts estimate that um, it will take uh, the states 50 years to recover and sums of money in the range of 250 to 300 billion dollars. And it does not appear that there will be sufficient budgets or even motivation for civilian reconstruction um, of Syria in the near future. On their side, Russia and Iran lack the financial and economic capacities to invest massively in Syria in order to boost national production and reconstruction. At the same time, Syria um, is much more dependent on the outside world, 
And more precisely, again, it's two allies, Moscow and Tehran, for even for key products and commodities such as oil, um, wheat. US policy in Syria in general, and with regard to uh, reconstru reconstruction in particular, is yet to be determined under the new administrations. But it seems that the US will not participate unless meaningful political reforms will be implemented. And I seriously doubt that the current regime would go along with that. So Assad has no easy way out. Um, however, in spite of all these challenges, he's preparing himself to run uncontested as usual in the next um, presidential election. Looking ahead, it seems that there is no future for Syria under Assad and that the current regime will continue to guarantee chaos, instability, and conflict for many years to come. A large part of the population does not and probably will not accept him as a legitimate ruler. And though the Syrian people continue to suffer, it seems that they have not yet lost hope and are searching for help and support, especially from the new um, Biden administration. Um, um, to enforce the immediate implementation of the UN uh, Security Council Resolution uh, 2254. So I will wrap up by saying that writing this book made me realize once again that Syria still matters and that unless the international community acts more assertively in the diplomatic, humanitarian and economic aspects, we will probably see a worsening situation. That means more refugees, more extremism, and more regional instability. So the bottom line is that the conditions uh, that caused the uprising 10 years ago will only get worse. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valenci and Ambassador Rabinovich. Uh, great summary of your book. Uh, the book um, is not a particularly long book, but it is packed with amazing analysis and research, and it provides in my view, the very, very best summary of how we got to where we are today in Syria. Um, okay, I was taken off video for a second, but now I'm back. Um, so now we're gonna move to our uh, two very distinguished commentators, um, Andrew Tabler and Professor Amr Al-Azam. Let me introduce uh, them both. And uh, Professor uh, Al-Azam will begin. Let me start by introducing Andrew Tabler, who is the Martin Gross Fellow in the Geduld Program on Arab Politics at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, where he focuses on Syria and US policy in the Levant. Until recently, Andrew served as senior advisor to the Special Envoy for Syria Engagement at the US Department of State's Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs and Director for Syria at the National Security Council's Middle East Affairs Directorate. Uh, he previously served as co-founder and editor-in-chief of Syria Today uh, as a consultant on Syria. He's the author of Syria's Collapse and How Washington Can Stop It, um, a longtime friend of the UCLA Center for Middle East Development, and uh, we welcome him today. But leading off um, of this portion of the program will be our very, very distinguished uh, colleague, Professor Amr Al-Azam, uh, who is a professor at Shawnee State University in Ohio, um, received his doctoral degree from University College London in 1991, taught at the University of Damascus in Syria until 2006. He's the founder and executive board member of the Day After Project and currently coordinates uh, the Heritage Protection Initiative for Cultural Heritage Protection in Syria. And as you heard from Ambassador Rabinovich, the son of the late Sadiq Al-Azam, um, Al we're very, very um, uh, lucky and very honored to have you with us today, Professor Al-Azam, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve, uh, and thank you everyone uh, for attending this. And uh, I think it's a great honor to be invited uh, to uh, speak here and it is not often that one gets invited to uh, reflect on a requiem. <laughs> and uh, so it immediately, uh, you know, uh, made me think about um, the whole issue of Syria once again. Uh, 
we were coming up, you know, we'd just come up to the 10 year mark. And um, I have to be honest, I was trying to not think as much about it. And then this came through and it made me kind of reflect again. Are we reading the final rights on uh, uh, the, the country that is known as Syria, um, a country and a society that has ruptured across every possible cleavage um, through this conflict, sectarian, social, e economic, um, rural ur versus urban, um, uh, you know, do you, any possible cleavage that existed within this society, um, the, the minute it, it was put under this, the, the strain and stress of this conflict, um, it completely disintegrated. And for me, that kind of made me start to think uh, along several lines, first and foremost, as to why, you know, is this normal? Is it, you know, the minute a, a country suffers uh, such a su su such a stress, such a, you know, a situation, is that an inevitable outcome or is there something else here? And of course, um, when one reads the book, particularly uh, in the first uh, two chapters, you begin to understand why this happened. First and foremost for me, and this is, I'm sure many would agree here as well, that there is, there has always been a lack of a strong national identity. The Syrian state, the modern Syrian state that came out of the um, end of the uh, first, the, the end of the Ottoman Empire, I'd say, and then later on the end of the First World War, uh, after the, the the mandates were 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 finally uh, removed, it was never going to be. It was never a, a strong state. It was never a state that was going to carry itself through. And again, the book um, goes through the various aspects of this, but the fact that there was never real work done by the founders, if you will, or the, 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 the people responsible for bringing this modern state forward, any real work done on, on fostering, developing, encouraging a strong national identity. And instead, we ended up with this a wide array of super identities, all competing, some political, ideological, religious, and, and effectively relegating the, 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 the national identity way down the, um, the the priority scale, and I think uh, this really then uh, goes at the heart of of why Syria essentially collapsed so spectacularly as a result of this um, this conflict. Um, Hafez al-Assad uh, for thirty years was able to stabilize Syria through his uh, authoritarian uh, regime, and um, essentially. Uh, the, the the iron rule that he, he he practiced was the glue that held the place together, and he did it also by building specific alliances um, with and all of this is very richly described in the book um, with with uh, you know not just with his within his own um, Alawite uh, minority sort of community but or even other minorities but extended it to uh, rural uh, groups uh, urban groups um, uh, you know the the merchant classes he co-opted so many aspects so many parts of Syrian society and 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 made them in a way uh, part of this uh, process and held it together. His son, of course, when Bashar al-Assad takes over, um, he very quickly uh, squanders all this. And this is um, very well addressed, I think, in chapter two. We see how uh, Bashar al-Assad, through a variety of, a number of, I should say, uh, critical errors along the way and circumstances perhaps that were um, out of his control, some uh, out of his own making, effectively uh, squanders um, the what what his father had had left him, and uh, setting uh, us up for the events that then take place when the Arab Spring comes through, um, sweeping across um, Syria, beginning in, um, in you know in uh, March of two thousand eleven, but. You know, and for me, when I was kind of thinking about all this, it, it made me start to think about, well, what makes me a Syrian? I mean, I've 
uh, I've lived and, and what, you know, how do I see myself, uh, you know, where's my certain identity? And if I can't find it comfortably, who else can find it? Um, and how do Syrians look at this um, uh, weakness and how, how can we sort of get around that? Uh, I, I was born in Beirut. Um, I lived uh, there for 18 years. I lived in, the, in England uh, for another near 15, 18 years. Um, I went back to Syria. Uh, the shortest, in fact, part of my life that I've ever lived was in Syria. And then I currently live in the United States and I've been living there for going on 15 years now. So, and, uh, you know, technically speaking, where does, you know, I, why do I feel a strong connection to Syria? It's not because I've lived there longest. Um, theoretically, uh, yet I have this very passing or almost casual nostalgic relationship with um, both uh, Lebanon, even though I was born there and I went to school there, and with England, where I lived for you know nearly 18 years, and I actually happen to be a British citizen uh, as, as well. But yet I have this, like I said, this, this casual, uh, almost nostalgic relationship. And I think the answer then came to me in that it has more to do with the fact that there is a historical connection. The one that um, even though I've lived there the shortest period of time, it's that historical connection that connects me to Syria. And then thinking again, I suddenly realized, no, it doesn't connect me to Syria. It connects me to Damascus and took me straight back to the idea of the fact that there isn't a national identity. It's an identity centered around my city or my tribe or my sect or my, um, you know, uh, region, but never that strong national identity. And with that, um, then it all became clear as to why we, you know, what, what happened happened in Syria. And 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 the book kind of came for me, at least, it, 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 it kind of came together um, for, for to, to help me understand these events better. So from the, from that lens and looking at what less what's left of Syria today, it, you know it, it, it's divided into uh, you know completely fragmented. Uh, there uh, the, the regime controls around sixty percent of the uh, of the country, but then uh, the the whole eastern part of Syria is, is uh, falls under the Kurdish and Allied uh, control. The north is under obviously, and the Idlib region is under. Um, uh, opposition control, um, the, the, uh, the, the regime itself uh, lacks any real meaningful sovereignty, even in the areas it controls. It controls less than 15% of its borders. Uh, the economy is in a perilous state. The institutions, uh, the state institutions have collapsed. They're barely functional. They've just announced uh, literally in the last day or two that they no longer uh, they, they want they, they, they can no longer have people staying at work so they've cut the work hours um, we've you know the, the book is really very depressing and so when one considers all this and you look at the title Syrian Requiem you think okay this seems very depressingly appropriate but then I had to pause myself because that would be a terrible you know end to all this and so I began to think, is there a possibility of um, a resurrection somewhere? You know, when you think of Requiem, maybe there's a resurrection there too. Is there a phoenix that's going to rise from the ashes somewhere along the line? And uh, I, I don't think the book gives us any sense of hope. And I am going to, I, th I think I'm, it's going to require a lot more reflection on my part. Right now, all I see is another 50 years of conflict. I'm going to end with this and uh, pass the baton on to, to um, Andrew uh, Tabler, who um, will probably pick up from here and take it away. Thank you, Professor Andrew. Over to you. Uh, great. Um, first of all, um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. As Steve mentioned, until recently, uh, I served in the U.S. Special Envoy's office and before that on the National Security Council uh, concerning Syria policy. Um, and it was a great pleasure um, to read this book as I decompress 
uh, from that experience. It would have actually been handy to have um, this book while I was uh, serving in government. Uh, although, um, like many experiences, uh, when in government, uh, you don't have any time really to read, uh, certainly not uh, um, even books uh, of this length. Uh, I was lucky enough in the Special Envoy's office in the tail end of my service to, um, to be able to read more uh, widely um, and base some of those, um, um, base some of um, my observations from the region in, uh, in understandings in the US government. So, uh, and I um, would like to comment a little bit about the book as in general, and then a little bit more about uh, the uh, international and regional aspects. Um, and then of course, in the conclusion, as I worked on that policy with Ambassador Jeffrey in particular, um, uh, which is addressed in the um, chapter six and then, the, then towards the conclusion. So a couple of general um, observations like Amr, I was, uh, I think it, it was actually in reading it, I felt a uh, sort of release. I thought it was an extremely efficient way to deal with uh, uh, a very um, complex war uh, and crisis until now. Uh, I realize it as Ambassador Rabinovich said that it is not uh, a narrative, but it's certainly read easily. Uh, it kept my attention easily, which is, as you know, from reading um, a lot of work on Syria, that's not an easy task. There's a lot of really boring stuff out there, not because the right, writers uh, are particularly bad, it's because some of it's really down in the weeds and hard to relate. Um, and I think they were able to handle uh, the, the, the complexity of the, of the crisis uh, very well. Um, and I really like the structure. Um, I like how in chapter two, uh, they were able to deal with it and sort of tour de force uh, so that you could feel the different twists and turns in the conflict. Um, and I found success in my own uh, analyses and writing uh, uh, in writing those because I think people really crave them. Uh, and I think Sir Syrians certainly do too. Uh, they, um, in expressing their concerns um, and horrors that came out of this war, uh, they look to works um, to help explain uh, their experience to Western audiences in particular, but into the international environment. And I think this book really succeeds uh, in that. But where it, where it also succeeds, and we dealt with this in the Special Envoy's office and talked about it extensively, it's true that the Syria conflict is complex, um, but what makes the Syria conflict particularly difficult to solve it, are the complications, it, it is complicated. And what I, I'm drawing a distinction here, complex means many moving parts. Complicated uh, to me uh, means that it's not only involving different parts, but also you have different factions meddling with those parts. Uh, and this is where uh, the parallels with uh, Patrick Seale's book, The Struggle for Syria come in. This really was and continues to be a struggle for the heart of the Middle East and you know, from an American perspective, Syria was never important to the United States, um, other than the fact it was an adversary during the Cold War as a Soviet satellite state, um, but that also that it was just geography. And I uh, would say in a Washington DC um, environment that Syria was the row house in the middle of the block. So unlike Lebanon, which was the small row house on the end of the block, when it burned down and uh, filled, you know, um, filled up with uh, uh, terrorist elements and so on. Um, the intervention of the two neighboring row houses, Israel and Syria under Hafez al-Assad contained that conflict. Uh, Syria is not that kind of conflict. Uh, it's the row house in the middle of the block. What happens there didn't stay there. And, uh, and so it spread. Um, and and uh, this book very aptly captures that complexity. Um, of the different sides. I would say though that there are two, two areas where I would like to see both authors because, um, uh, because they're both experts in their own right, um, drill down a little bit more. Um, and that is one on Israeli decision-making. It is addressed in the book, uh, but there's a, my understanding from my time in government and elsewhere is that there's a lot more behind it. It, it was a tremendous debate um, and, uh, and I think the authors did a very good job of talking about 
how uh, uh, that, you know, until the fall of Aleppo, that uh, the sort of good neighbor policy came into play. I, I think though that, that more needs to be done uh, on that, um, particularly in the current environment. Um, the second one is related to the, the, the first thing I said here in terms of areas for further study. And that is the map, the, the, the work in front of us sketches out very clearly the degree of regional intervention and particularly Iranian involvement in the, in the country. But the thing that the general public struggles with, the thing that we struggled with in the US government in explaining our own policy was that the maps that depict the regime's quote unquote control of territory uh, are only differentiated in the areas where ISIS has some sway. Uh, it, is, it is not um, the activities of Iranian-backed militia, which the United States bombed only days ago or weeks ago, um, uh, are not depicted. And I think if, that, if future maps are, do include those areas, which are not easy because they do change, but we do know that Iranian militia are, um, uh, and Hezbollah are along the uh, Lebanese-Syrian uh, frontier, which Ambassador Rabinovich and uh, a Dr. Valenci spoke about, but they are also out in the Middle Euphrates River Valley um, uh, where the Biden administration struck not too long ago um, and where um, they are positioned uh, in the future to control a major land border uh, across, um, which is called the GLOC, the ground line of communication. And the one that really, I think, strategically concerns both Israel and the United States, but not only. Uh, there's, there's another aspect of this, I think, that can be addressed, um, and it is in the book, but I think there's a lot more room for uh, discussion in the future, and that is the degree to which this conflict, and I think the overall struggle with Iran, between the Iran and the um, Arab and Israeli uh, societies, drove the Arabs and the Israelis together, uh, which is just an unbelievable part of this. It was a part of uh, the Trump administration's policies I did not deal with um, uh, personally, but, uh, but those developments have changed the landscape uh, in the Middle East and a lot of the options that the United States and its allies have at their disposal. Previously, the United States thought that it had to deal with allies that, uh, whose interests were diametrically opposed to each other in, in regards to Arab countries and, and Israel. That's no longer the case. Um, will, will that alliance um, as such or uh, detente uh, will that um, allow for a better address um, or better addressing of the Iranian threat? We, we will have to see, and I think this is where um, the um, th this is noteworthy. I think in in terms of the current American administration, we have yet to have the appointment of uh, a special envoy. Uh, we have an acting envoy, uh, but we don't have a an envoy appointed. Uh, who uh, reports directly to the secretary and one on par in, 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 a, in a sort of diplomatic sense, not, not otherwise, um, in, in terms of when Ambassador Jeffrey was on the team. And, um, and why, why I point this out is that um, the complexity of the conflict is hard enough. When you get the complications of the different parties involved, um, it just takes up a tremendous amount of diplomatic bandwidth. And it's something that, that deserves a dedicated envoy. Um, and so far, we haven't seen that. Instead, we've seen envoys for uh, Iran and for Yemen uh, appointed, um, both of whom are dealing with um, Iranian activities in the region. Syria remains a, a question mark and, and one that, and, and, um, and a, in a way, a policy vacuum that I think uh, has, um, uh, needs to be filled, um, at, least, at least bureaucratically, so that we can all move forward. Because as Omar points out, and I'll end with this, I don't see an easy end to the Syria conflict either. Um, the fact is that this start, stopped being a civil war a long time ago. It is a, regional, a regionalized and internationalized proxy war in which different parties, um, and you can see this on the map in the front of the book, have intervened in Syrian territory uh, and their positions are relatively light and sustainable and not economically draining. And the, the challenge in this environment is trying to support the Syrian people who exist in these different areas. And I think very much like the United States after World War II, 
um, when the prospects of the United Germany were not uh, in the cards because of the outbreak of the Cold War, uh, some pretty hard decisions are going to have to be made by the international community about um, about reconstruction. And uh, and and while the United States uh, cannot and should not be involved in a reconstruction that's not sustainable, particularly in regime controlled areas, it does have a greater uh, ability to affect um, areas it, do it does have influence, particularly in Eastern Syria, along with its allies elsewhere in Syria. And, uh, and so with that, with that, I'll end and, and hand it over to the group. Thank you. Thank you so much to our two very, very distinguished commentators for your wonderful comments about this very, very important book. Now we'll move into the panel discussion phase of our webinar uh, in which our two authors will uh, have a discussion with our two commentators. And so let me begin by inviting Ambassador Rabinovich and Dr. Valenci to um, respond to some of the comments that uh, we just heard from Professor Alazan and from Andrew Tabler. Ambassador, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me respond to, to the reflections of uh, Amar al Azam and the question of uh, uh, Requiem and uh, is there a Syria? Will there, will there be a Syria? Uh, I agree with uh, uh, Kamit Valencia's uh, statement before, it will be a while before there is a, a consolidated Syrian state. Um, but there, are, there is a, a sort of a second life in a very large exiled Syrian community. There are now large communities of intellectuals, academics, professionals who live in Europe and some of them in, in the United States. They're very active in the social media. Um, they're active politically and uh, they, they continue. Uh, the, la the Syrian life in a way also continues uh, in exile, which is an entirely new dimension uh, to, uh, to the life of, uh, of Syria. With regard to uh, uh, Andrew's, uh, uh, Andrew Tabler's uh, uh, comments, um, it, it was very interesting to deal with the two administrations. There, there was a lot in much more in common uh, to the Obama administration and the Trump administration in, in Middle East and Syria policy than, let's say, the Obama people would like to, uh, to admit, because both essentially wanted uh, the pivot away certainly not to invest uh, uh, militarily. There was more order, I think, in the Obama administration because of the personality of, of Trump. After all, it was President Trump. We had a phone call with President Erdogan told him, you want Syria, you can have it. We are, we are leaving. And actually, uh, if, you, if you want to measure uh, efficiency of investment, then the 2,000 troops or so that are kept in northeastern Syria are a very good investment. It's a very small force, not too many casualties, and it, it keeps America in play. I mean, when there is time to try to put Syria together again, the United States needs a seat at the table and the, the military presence and the alliance with the uh, Kurdish uh, militia are very important uh, uh, assets. Let me add to this another dimension. We speak about uh, e economic uh, reconstruction. There's also the question of bringing back the refugees. I mean, the, there is a very large number of Syrian refugees, three and a half million in Turkey, about a million in Lebanon, a million in Jordan. They are in uh, definitely a, a yoke on these countries. The Turks, by the way, cynically also use the Syrian refugees as a way of leveraging vis-a-vis -vis Europe. They threaten the Europeans that if you do this and that, we'll just release another million Syrian refugees. And you all remember what happened in 2015, 2016 in Europe as a result of that wave of immigration. So to, to start normalizing life, refugees need to go back. The regime is not particularly interested in the Bashar al-Assad and his uh, group are quite happy to rule a smaller population, more coherent, a larger percentage of Alawites. They are not particularly interested in taking them back. And it should be a condition, political reform to some extent and uh, taking back the refugees as a way of starting to normalize life in and around Syria. Thank you. Dr. Valencia, and by the way, before Dr. Valencia, before you begin, we have a number of really, really great questions already from uh, our audience. And I just wanna remind those of you who would like to ask a question, please remember to identify who you are, 
what country you're from and what your affiliation is when you enter your question in the Q&A box at the bottom. Dr. Valenci. Thank you for wonderful comments and great observations. Um, I will address the comment about Israel policy. It was definitely one of the fascinating topics to uh, cover and analyze in our book. Um, at the very beginning, Israel has accepted Assad's regime um, continued rule uh, in line with its uh, preference for the devil we know, right? Other than an ongoing effort um, to disrupt the Iranian uh, military entrenchment in Syria, Israel basically chose to sit on the fence and avoid taking um, uh, part in the struggle between the rival uh, Syrian groups. At the same time, from at least in, in Israeli perspective, uh, it seemed that it was the equation is that was either Assad or ISIS. So obviously, uh, uh, that was the, the Israeli stance with regard to Assad back then. Israel also assumed that Assad is not interested in a direct confrontation with Israel, and to, uh, she was right about that. I think it took a while before Israel woke up and saw that Iran and its proxies uh, were exploiting the opportunities and the chaos in, in Syria in order to reinforce their influence and by developing its military uh, capabilities. Um, so with regard to the devil we know approach, I think there is an ongoing debate in Israel nowadays about whether that was the right approach or thinking ahead or in, with regard to the future of Syria, whether this is the right uh, approach to hold. And I think that there are many voices today in Israel uh, and which I personally support uh, that should recommend to reassess uh, the devil we know approach uh, and that stems from four basic uh, assumptions. First of all, Bashar al-Assad is giving Iran the opportunity to expand and consolidate its influence in Syria on various levels for the long term, um, thereby posing a very significant security challenge to Israel on its uh, northern border. Second, it seems that no political solution to the crisis in Syria can be um, expected as long as Assad uh, remains in power. His stubborn position uh, to any reforms or any con uh, uh, concessions uh, is a major obstacle to any effort to achieve uh, progress um, toward a settlement, either with the UN and mediation or even by uh, Russia. Third, um, where the Assad regime is involved, the argument that uh, there is a responsible actor with whom rules of the game can be established. Uh, and I think this is a assumption is no longer valid. I mean, we have a clear demonstration in southern Syria, uh, the fact that the reg regime uh, regained control of the area in the summer of 2018, and the situation there is very chaotic. So allegedly, Assad controls this area, but chaos uh, prevailed there with a mixed multitude of armed uh, factions fighting each other and the regime unable to restrain them. And finally, I think, uh, especially as you know, being an Israeli, I think that beyond the strategic assessment of this uh, situation, the moral aspect should be uh, considered. Recognition of, of uh, the legitimacy of a leader who has committed war crimes for years and continue to abuse uh, civilians is nothing less than a disgrace uh, for those seeking to accept him into the regional and international uh, order. So that's in a nutshell about the Israeli uh, point of view. Okay, thank you, Dr. Valenci. Uh, Andrew, does that answer your question for a little bit more in-depth view from the Israeli perspective? Yes, it does. Um, I think it's. I think the responses of both authors were uh, were quite good. I actually don't. Um, I, rather, what I was saying was that I think it is for all of us who have dealt with the Syria crisis diplomatically and academically, but also for Syrians in particular, it's an ongoing crisis. I think it's just an area of the, the, uh, that needs maybe further reflection, further work, um, as we also, in, as Dr. Rabinovich said, uh, that the US policy was the one that was oftentimes in the limelight um, and, uh, and maybe a little bit easier to track. I just think that there are a lot of people who have Questions about Israeli um, about Israeli policy, um, but uh, but again, the book I think deals with um, the regionalized regionalized parties, the regional involvement uh, very well and very efficiently. Yeah, so uh, we have a lot of questions coming in, and Professor Alazan, we would love to hear your response to 
what our authors just said, but I may cut short our panel discussion a smidge to allow enough time to get to as many of our questions as we can, because I think you're going to be very interested to hear what our audience is asking. Uh, but go ahead, Professor. Right, let me unmute myself. I'll, I'll be brief with uh, uh, just uh, two short comments. Um, you know, uh, uh, Ambassador Rabinovich um, said something that kind of struck uh, with me just now. He talked about the diaspora, the Syrian diaspora, and how maybe uh, the resurrection, uh, the seeds of that resurrection may be carried with that diaspora. I mean, we as Syrians have been talking about a Noah's Ark since as early as 2013, 2014. And, um, you know, in, in a way, that's what how we see uh, at least the diaspora, but we're still struggling with this issue of identity again. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm still trying to find how I'm connecting with other Syrians. Am I connecting them as someone from Damascus, talking to someone else from Damascus? What do I have in common with someone who comes from Idlib or someone who comes from Aleppo or someone who comes from the Eastern uh, region? We're still trying to bring these things through. Um, and, and for us, these are, uh, you know, th these are living issues that we're addressing. Uh, just one other quick comment uh, for Dr. Karmid. Um, I would only point out that um, the, the debate on what we do with the devil we know versus the devil we know we don't um, was certainly ongoing as early as 2012 in, in, in my experience. Um, definitely the, these, these were issues and debates going on within uh, Israeli decision making circles and um, definitely in 2013 and definitely in 2014 and in fact we see uh, the changes and shifts in, 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 in behavior and engagement um, on the ground and again with the, with the opposition in, in the Golan if you recall um, based around some of these issues and I think what kind of pulled things back again was the Russian intervention which kind of gave uh, the Israelis a new kind of uh, partner, if you will, or, or a new actor to kind of uh, interact with. Otherwise, if had the Russians not intervened, I think we'd have seen a, a continued sort of engagement in, in, in what we saw in 2014 and 2015, 2013, etc. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. So we'll take as many of your questions as I can get to. We had, do have a hard stop at a quarter past the hour. So without further ado, let me get to our first question for our authors and our two commentators, whoever would like to jump in, please go ahead and uh, feel free to uh, provide your uh, responses to the questions first. From uh, our friend, the great journalist, Konstantin Eggert from Deutsche Welle, Russia, where he's an analyst. His question is, would you agree that now Putin is as dependent on Assad as Assad is on Putin? In other words, can Putin leave Syria? And if so, how, or is he stuck there? Who would like to take that one? Let me take the first shot. Uh, I think that that may, uh, that may be a bit of an overstatement, but uh, it is quite correct. Uh, normally, or generally speaking, the Russian intervention in Syria is considered a great success for Putin and Russia. It, uh, um, gave him a lot of prestige. It stood in contradistinction to a passive and not very effective uh, American policy. It gave him more confidence in the Middle East. We, we can see Russian activity later in Libya and uh, in other places. But he would like at some point to see an end to that, and that is not visible. He, we know that uh, he would like Assad uh, to offer some uh, political reform. Uh, I call it a Chechen uh, outcome. I mean, what uh, Putin did in Chechnya is he quashed the opposition brutally, and then he imposed sort of a political uh, formula. He would like to see the same in Syria. The uh, opposition was quashed brutally, but the second part is not coming. And there were periods in which we saw indications that uh, he was not that happy with Assad. There is the famous scene where he came to Syria and he was... Uh, more cordial towards the head of the Tigers militia than he was to uh, Bashar al-Assad and Kremlinologists and the Maskologists and spent a lot of ink on that on that issue. So uh, 
Yes, there's a, a strong point to the question, but I think it's slightly overstated. Professor al -Azam, what do you think about this uh, potential dilemma for Putin? Um, I, I don't know if it's really a dilemma. I, I go back to what was said sort of earlier uh, by the authors and uh, by Andrew. I don't think this was this is an expensive uh, adventure. This is not an, uh, an Afghanistan or you know a Vietnam or anything like that. So I, I think Putin is is fine, he, and um, I don't even think he he considers Assad to be a burden for him. You know, he's he he he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, and 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 for for the Russians. Uh, and, and, you know, the only kink maybe for them is if the Iranians start to get um, more, a larger share of, of the spoils. And I don't think that's happening either. I think um, right now the, the um, you know, the Russians are uh, having the upper hand on this. And I think that's also reflected in, in, in the book. So I think Putin is in a comfortable place. Yeah. And Andrew, to, to go back to my career in the business world, if we use the uh, metric of return on investment, ROI, Putin has done extremely well in Syria. A lot of return for relatively little, little investment. How's that compared to the U.S. approach? U.S. approach has been um, uh, far more in terms of um, the, uh, not so much the, the blood and treasure as the Iraq war, but, uh, but in terms of intervening later, ended up being far more costly and also politically limiting. Um, so that's a, that, that's a major uh, problem, especially as concerns the outcome of the Syrian um, quote unquote civil war. And the, the authors talk about this in the book, there's a distinction between the two. Um, I do think though that the main reason um, that uh, Russia to Konstantin's question, um, Russia's, is, Russia intervened not on its own, but in support of Qasem Soleimani's mosaic strategy. And so with that, you're together. The problem is that Assad, it puts Assad in a position of being able to triangulate. So if he doesn't get what he wants, and he, and he does this all the time, it's fascinating uh, looking at this in, in depth. Uh, if he doesn't get what he wants from Russia, he goes to the Iranians and then vice versa. They're, they're, they're two um, not mutually exclusive tracks. And so, when you ever want your, your client to make a change, they don't necessarily have to do so. And that then drives up your cost later on and you can get mired and hooked in it, but it is quite sustainable. It's quite sustainable for all, for all parties. And that's probably the reason why this conflict absent a major change will continue to, to involve a divided Syria. And uh, just on the issue of Russia, my colleague, Professor Zev Yaroslavsky from the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs, Department of Public Policy, is asking whether in the long term, uh, Dr. Valencia, is Putin looking for sort of a status quo, fragmentation, uh, fracturing, uh, et cetera, or in, is it in Russia's interest for Syria to uh, come together again as a regional player as a as a cohesive a cohesive political entity. What do you think? Well, I would say that um, Moscow is most interested in stabilizing the situation today in Syria um, by promoting a political settlement and reconstruction, and also, of course, to secure its uh, military and economic interests and penetrate to the regime's armed forces. Um, economically, it still seeks to recover at least part of its uh, investment uh, through reconstruction by exploiting uh, Syria's natural resources, or at least what uh, left for the, from these uh, resources. But I, I beg to differ. I think that after five, more than five years of intervention, um, Russia has a limited ability to turn Syria into a success story or even uh, prevent the countries from collapsing. As I uh, mentioned earlier, it does not have the uh, economic ability to uh, support Syria's uh, economic crisis. And it also has to do, um, you know, all the obstacles has to do with the uh, presence of other foreign actors, uh, the hostility of local population. And I hear it from many Syrians that they're quite uh, resent the, the um, Russian presence in, on the ground. And mainly, as I mentioned earlier, the stubbornness of Assad and all of these uh, factors are posing uh, major obstacles for Russia. 
And yet, interestingly, Russia holds on to Assad and continues to try to persuade the international community uh, to normalize relation with this uh, regime on the basis that Assad won the war and that his regime is the only entity able to stabilize Syria. Uh, this is uh, very, something that is very interesting to see. I remember that last year, um, it was in April actually, uh, there was a very interesting development with regard to a uh, Russian um, uh, attitude towards Assad. And in some uh, Russian media, uh, official media, uh, it was published that uh, basically criticized Assad. Uh, um, he was described as weak, corrupt, and lacking in public support. And we were very um, you know, curious to see how things will develop after hearing this uh, uh, Russian criticism of Assad. Eventually, as I said, Russia will probably stick to the devil uh, they know, and they will probably continue to uh, support Assad in the near future. Great, thank you, Dr. Valenci. Uh, next question. Uh, Professor Al-Azam, I'll direct to you. It's from our very dear friend at CMED, uh, Professor Sima Kalicholu from Istanbul, Turkey. And she's asking, do you see any possibility for the Syrian refugees, particularly the ones living in Lebanon and Turkey, to return to their homeland in the near future? And if so, how and under what uh, means of facilitation can this be accomplished? Hello, Sima. Always uh, good to hear from you. Um, you know, uh, the, the issue of the refugees, you know, the, the, I think it's important to understand that not all refugees are the same. There are uh, people who are refugees because their lives are in danger. They're wanted by the regime. If they go back, they will be arrested, put in jail, tortured, etc. And for those, I think as long as the regime is there, then they can never go back. Um, but there's, again, a very, another very important category that we don't often think about. And these are actually, in many cases, potentially even regime supporters, or at the very least, not against the regime. And in some cases, actually come from the regime's own sort of uh, areas and, and strongholds, um, and even from the, from the Alawite group. And these are the young men who are eligible for military service. Many of these young men, and uh, you know, don't want to 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 go to fight. They don't want to die. Uh, being for you know, being forced to go and join Assad's army in Ad is is almost like a death sentence. So that's another important group that, even though they would like to go back, cannot go back um, at the moment because they will be forced into conscription. And then you have a a third group, and I think. A, probably the largest and, 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 and most significant, who again, in their own right, are um, refugees against their own will in the sense that, you know, maybe they're not wanted by the regime, maybe they're not even going to be conscripted, but they've lost their means of, of, of sustaining themselves. They've lost their homes, they've lost their land, they've lost their livelihoods. So going back for them, is effectively, uh, in a way, a death sentence. So there are so many factors that have to come into play. You need the, re you know, you need the war to end. You need the reconstruction. You need economic um, revival or some some means for these people to to support themselves. You need the issue of conscription to kind of be addressed before any of these refugees can really. So in answer to your question, Seema, before there is a serious and fundamental uh, addressing of the of the conflict conflict and bringing it towards some form of resolution. I don't see these refugees going back home anytime soon. Let me, unless anybody else wants to jump in, I've got a, a lot more questions. We're not going to have time to get to all of them, but let me take two of them that are uh, interesting. And I'm going to, um, with the permission of the questioners, modify the questions just a bit in order to spur some discussion. Uh, Shahram Mazmude from the United States is suggesting that the best way to secure Syria's future would be for the international community to basically decide that, okay, Bashar survived, and so we may as well rally behind him, prop him up, and rebuild Syria with uh, the Assad regime continuing in place. Whereas uh, our friend uh, Joe uh, Jabali from Lebanon is suggesting the opposite, uh, arguing that the tyranny, the brutality that both uh, Hafez al-Assad and Bashar al-Assad have uh, inflicted on the Lebanese people is reason enough to oust the Assad regime once and for all 
from power and replace it with something else. So where do we go from here in terms of uh, the Assad family? Ambassador Rabinovich, maybe I'll ask you to start. Uh, thank you. So uh, I think the, uh, the first uh, position, uh, if you look at the, at the principle laid out by President Biden and his administration for uh, the international system in, in the coming years, just shoring up Assad because uh, uh, he's the most uh, effective uh, local, local force without return of refugees and at least a modicum of political reform would not be acceptable. Uh, at the same time, the, the, the policy of maximum pressure that, that was very much the hallmark of the, the Trump administration and the professionals that ran the policy uh, under him uh, has so far not, not produced uh, the required uh, result. I think that uh, we need to look at the, the larger international scene, ask ourselves um, where, uh, where will the Biden administration fight itself with regard to Russia and to China? It, it will not fight with both China and Russia. China seems like the, the more dangerous, the more uh, significant adversary. And if there is, despite the rhetoric of the past few weeks, uh, a modus vivendi with, with Russia, it could come to include a uh, commonly accepted Syria policy. Uh, if Turkey is brought in, um, then other possibilities open up. For instance, with regard to the refugees in Turkey, that the question that was asked uh, earlier, the Turks at some point have spoken about settling, uh, settling Syrian refugees in, at the northern edge of, of Syria, an area that they now, they now control. Let's bear in mind that northeastern Syria is the richest part of the country. It has the oil. Uh, it is very fertile agriculturally, but this needs a very radical rethinking and a large regional and international uh, concert cooperation. So far it's not visible, but maybe with a longer range in, in mind, it uh, could be the basis of a new Syrian policy for the international community. Okay, um, anyone else want to comment? Otherwise I'll move on to the next question, which is also very intriguing from Jaap Werner of the Netherlands, who is serving as a diplomat for the Dutch government in Iran right now. And he mentions uh, that uh, ISIS has uh, begun to rear its head again, somewhat resurgent. Uh, he mentions that the United States and Iran uh, both found some common ground in the last few years uh, with respect to anti-ISIS activity. And he's asking whether or not there is possibly a basis, and maybe we should have Rob Malley here to answer this question, but is there a basis for U.S.-Iranian cooperation and U.S.-Iranian rapprochement, perhaps, uh, as they look at a resurgent ISIS and perhaps find a way to cooperate in, uh, uh, on, that, on that basis? Uh, Dr. Valenci, uh, Andrew, either of you have a comment on that? Answer will be short. Uh, I don't see it, um, any chance that there will be a uh... Uh, cooperation uh, under the, you know, the banner of uh, fighting ISIS. I think that the U.S. has uh, more natural uh, partners in Syria to uh, most prominently, of course, are the Kurds, the SDF. Um, so I think that, you know, there are a lot of uh, things that Iran and the U.S. should uh, uh, solve before cooperating uh, with regard to ISIS. I, I find it hard to believe that it will happen anytime soon. Andrew, what do you think? Yeah, I, I would just say from a, a U.S. well standpoint, I, I think that the, the the problem is is that um, you can uh, you can use different assets to hit ISIS, but the, the problem is is that the political settlement that 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 uh, would have to come that would not that it would not cause ISIS to come back uh, that is not there. So they have two different objectives: uh, the, the U.S. and Iran because of the, um, the US wants a negotiated settlement to the Syrian crisis, does not want regime change. You didn't even during the Trump administration. Um, Iran instead wants, uh, wants an Assad regime that's resurgent and continues to go back to the way it was before, but yet with more Shia militia involvement, that this is not going to solve um, the problem of ISIS in a Sunni majority country. Um, yep, 
Uh, let's move on to the next one. We've got a couple of minutes left. I'll, maybe I can squeeze in one or two more. First is from our dear friend, Mark Ott from Belgium, um, who um, uh, doesn't mention this in his question, but refers to the fact that Bashar was uh, studying ophthalmology in London. Uh, and he's asking, was he in fact a reluctant uh, successor to his father? And if his brother Basel had not died in that uh, famous automobile accident, uh, would things have been different for Syria? Yes, go ahead, Professor. Let me, let me, let me take that one, if you don't mind. Well, uh, uh, at least amongst Syrians, and I'm sure out beyond as well, you know, for us, we look at this whole family affair it, through the, you know, uh, the trilogy of the Godfather. And uh, essentially, you know, Bashar is sometimes cast as um, Al Pacino's character, who, who somehow was groomed to be the guy who was not going to be part of the family business. It was going to be Basil um, who was going to do that. And then he dies in the car accident and that forces Bashar to kind of uh, take over. Well, okay, yes, maybe, but um, and maybe so, but, but I don't think that necessarily sort of, uh, you know, removes the fact that this is, in, you know, strictly a family business and it, it was always going to remain in the family. And um, I don't think anyone for one second really believes that Bashar Lassad was going to come back home having trained as an ophthalmologist and was going to go and work as an ophthalmologist, no more than, uh, you know, uh, any other member of the Assad family who uh, studied to be a dentist or a dog. I, th I think, um, you know, uh, or, or a lawyer or is ever going to practice that that, that profession. Uh, this is this is what they do. This is who they are, and this is what they'll always be. Yeah, yeah. Steve, if, if I may, please. It only shows us that even ophthalmologists can suffer from myopia. <laughs> well, I think that is a perfect note on which we can bring the webinar to an end. Um, I would like to thank our two distinguished authors. Ambassador Rabinovich and Dr. Valenci and our two wonderful commentators, uh, Professor Alazam and Andrew Tabler. Uh, and I wanna thank our audience for your fantastic questions. I apologize that we were not able to get to all of your questions, but uh, perhaps our authors and commentators would be willing to take a look at them and send responses to us, which we can then convey to those of you who didn't have a chance for your questions to be asked and answered. Let me remind you um, that uh, the book that we've been talking about, Syrian Requiem, the Civil War and its Aftermath, uh, is available to those of you who would uh, like to purchase it at a 30% discount. Uh, the discount code you see there at the bottom left, RBVCH. Um, and I highly, highly recommend the book. It is amazing for anyone interested uh, in learning and understanding about how Syria came to be the very tragic story that it is today. Um, with that, let me thank all of you so very, very much. Our next uh, CMED webinar is coming up on April the 29th. Um, you see it there mentioned on the right about the Abraham Accords. Uh, please uh, keep your eyes peeled for more information and, and upcoming announcements about that next event in our ongoing webinar series. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, stay safe. Have a wonderful evening, a wonderful rest of the day. And we'll see you all again at our next webinar. Thank you and goodbye. Right.